Welcome to Leading from Being with your hosts, Marty Spiegelman and Todd Hoskins. Marty and Todd explore topics related to consciousness, leadership, teams, and organizations. Today, they continue their series, Endings and Beginnings, sensing what is coming to completion, what is emerging, and the cycles of action that can move with these forces. The topic for episode 22 is governance. Rather than focusing on models of governance, Marty and Todd get into the dynamics of organizations that move beyond rigid structures and become negotiable in the experience of working together. They also introduce a new segment at the end of today's episode, Takeaways. Get show notes and much more at leadingfrombeing.com. Hello, thank you for tuning in to this important episode. Before we get into the conversation with Marty, we want to acknowledge that sometimes for many, these episodes may be difficult to follow or understand, and this could very well be true for today's conversation on governance. Though we talk for over an hour, we don't compare or analyze governance models. We're doing our best to let language flow through us that points to what it feels like when an organization or team is not stuck with a model, when we are letting the flows of our uniqueness and the interactions between us create their own structures, when we are following the flow of the underlying principles of consciousness. We recognize that this may seem wacky or irrelevant, but it's not. As practitioners, we get to engage in these experiences with clients without much explaining we are in experience with them. The challenge that we face in recording these conversations is that consciousness is not a set of rules or best practices or static knowledge that we can pass along. So we're playing with language that points to experience and principles and what can happen when leaders, all of us, start to see the world in a different way, experience the world in a different way, and allow our awareness to lead us and others without defining or controlling. I want to share some words from my colleague and friend, Marty Spiegelman. An about face is required of us now if we're to succeed in our role as crafters of a new world. Instead of asking our experiences and our world to serve ourselves and our individuation, we must learn to serve our experience instead. I encourage you to let these words and the words within this episode work their way through you. Try, if you can, not to decide what is true or even what is useful, but instead let your awareness sense what is being communicated beyond the words. We hope you enjoy the experience of listening as much as we enjoy the experience of sharing our conversations with you. Hello, and welcome to Leading from Being. My name's Marty Spiegelman, and I'm here with my colleague Todd Hoskins, bringing you our third episode in our series on the principle of new beginnings. We've been looking at what both the principle and the dynamics of new beginnings show us about leadership and about being a leader, and we've looked in a number of major arenas so far. Today, we're going to investigate these principles and dynamics in relationship to governance. So, Todd, I'm really excited for today's conversation. Me too. So much to talk about. And it's great to be with you as always, Marty. And welcome to our listeners, too. We're glad you've joined us for this important series. Marty, I believe you have an introduction to start us off. Uh, Talk to us about governance and the principle of new beginnings. All right. So... When, Todd, when you and I decided to do this episode on governance, I was very excited. I thought, well, it's a really great idea. It's a chance to bring entirely new perspectives to a topic that's often complicated and hard to discuss, let alone understand. So then I began thinking about it. And as I was gathering my deeper reflections on governance, I realized that you and I had kind of inadvertently stepped into a Western cultural quagmire where the quagmire is language itself. And I realized this because I Googled governance 
And, you know, I should have known, <laughs> but here's what I found out. So one website told me that governance is a method or mechanism for managing resources that can be applied to many goals. Okay, that's fine. So then I went to another site and that site announced that governance pertains to the vision of an organization and the translation of that vision into policy. Whereas management is all about making decisions for implementing those policies. Okay, that's interesting. So I kept going and I went to a third site that offered a business lens. And this site declared governance to be a kind of input that when consistently delivered at all levels of a system or an organization, creates a specific output. And in this business context, the site told me that governance creates a cu culture of excellence. So now governance is about culture. And this culture of excellence would produce excellent reputation, excellent products, excellent delivery systems, all of which would combine to generate good business performance. All right, well, I have kind of a range of definitions here. So I foolishly tried one more website where I read that the term governance can be used in many contexts. <laughs> and so um, this site tells me in general, governance means the process of decision making and the process by which decisions are implemented or not implemented. Well, I felt like I'd gone around in a big circle. So I paused my research and I felt again that quagmire of words. So of course I was on a roll and I looked up something else. I looked up the definition of quagmire. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines quagmire as soft, miry land that shakes or yields under the foot. And it's also defined as a difficult, precarious, or entrapping position, a predicament. And the Collins Dictionary offers this definition. A quagmire is a difficult, complicated, or unpleasant situation, which is neither easy to avoid nor easy to escape from. Now, these definitions of the word quagmire began to feel to me like very accurate definitions of the kinds of governance we experience in our world these days. Um, but, you know, they're still just that, they're definitions. And this brought me to a key point for you and me today. This ignited a memory for me of a conversation with a very wise elder in the Andes. And he spoke to us about a young man who was searching for God. And this poor young man wandered the mountains and the valleys looking for God, but not finding God. And finally, one day, he's sitting on a high plateau. And the plateau overlooks this beautiful valleys and peaks. And it was just an amazing um, chunk of scenery. But here's this young man. He's exhausted. He's sitting on a rock, holding his head in his hands, bemoaning the fact that no matter how hard he tried, he can't find God. And as he's sitting there, his head in his hands, his eyes shut tight, there were two things occurring. One was the most magnificent sunset ever seen in that whole entire region, painting the distant peaks in reds and golds and turning the sky deep blues and purples, all of which he didn't see because his eyes were closed. And in his mind, he was puzzling over the second thing that was occurring, a voice in his head that kept saying to him, are you looking for an experience or a definition? So if to our listeners, if our kind of conversation here at Leading for Being is your kind of conversation, I think we would all agree that we're definitely looking to create a new experience of governance. We certainly don't need another definition. And what Todd and I hope to do with you today is to dismantle a lot of definitions and explanations and make way for that shift into new experience. And we do this here at Leading from Being through principles of consciousness, through a new vision, through a greater curiosity and our willingness to always explore. So Todd, I wanna to hand this over to you with a little download I got about governance the other day and about governed systems. The thought came to me that governance in a truly conscious system 
is not achieved by decentralizing or by controlling. And these are two things that people have explored a lot, decentralizing or different kinds of controls. That, that governance in a truly conscious system is achieved by completely different dynamics and will create the experience that we're all longing for. And so I would love to toss this to you and see what it ignites in you. <laughs> oh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, you, you know, my first response was uh, hearing the definitions of quagmire. Uh, I'll remind you that our exploration of this episode started with talking about government and mm -hmm. Uh, different ways of seeing governing and government. And yeah. we actually decided to broaden it to governance, but talk about quagmire uh, if we were talking about government. Um, but it's actually part of the same conversation if we're talking about the dynamics of the system rather than the definition or structure of the system. You know, there there are so many models of governance um, in the business world that, you know, in, in my little corner of the universe are, are talked about frequently. I've tried to understand what is it that draws people to carry a flag for a model, a model that sometimes has really wise practices and underlying principles to it. But the model itself is not governance, and it's especially not the experience of governance. The model might lead to better experiences, but we can't ensure that. And the conversation around the dynamics is not really happening, I think, because it, we're, we're running into the language quagmire again of how do we talk about this if we're not talking about the thingness? Like, let's let's have a debate about the models of governance. And those are all things. Those are all things that we can um, sketch out on paper. And when we're talking about the experience, we, we do this dance with language that you and I often do on leading from being. It's, it's more difficult uh, definitely to define. But what if that's where the power is? Mm -hmm. Well... Yeah, you just um, ignited all of the principles of consciousness in me. This is something that, that I talk to people a lot about. I know, Todd, you and I talk about it. Um, Western consciousness, our awareness is focused on language, which is a, a thing. It's a We talk about thought forms. And so we easily focus on a framework, a structure. People want the structure because they don't have the awareness to experience how a structure comes into being. So they have to have it given to them. And consciousness produces frameworks. There's nothing wrong with it. This is how it works. You have a framework for a timing of action and the timing completes the framework shifts for the next timing, supposedly. Um, but this is all beyond the, the awareness of most people in the modern world. So they're looking for someone to give them a solid framework. But what always strikes me is um, they complain about what the framework then produces. They complain about their experience in that framework. And so what we have is really a problem of, from where I sit, a problem of sort of split consciousness. We've fractured our consciousness to the point where um, we see the outcome, we want the outcome, um, and we don't realize that the experience and the outcome are connected. So I think this thing that you said about dynamics versus structure, one of the things that, that we're tasked with at leading from being, and I think also in the work that we do individually, is teaching people about the dynamics of life, that life is, see, I heard you say the other day, life occurs in the dynamics. And it's the same thing the elders in the Andes and all indigenous cultures say. It's the dynamic, not the outcome that is so important. And so we have to help people experience. And then I think we might get a really different understanding. I'm not gonna use the word definition, if I can help it, we're gonna get a different understanding of governance. You know, there are principles right. that are actions, yeah? Right, right. Well, let, let's play around with a case study that's that's real and, and, and present. I was not planning this, but it, I'll just give it a try here. So I was actually working with a client 
and they are launching a new organization, and and they have about a uh, hundred members in that organization, and they want clarity on what their organization is and the expectations of the people within it and how they interact with one another. And well, now we get to governance, how decisions are made. Yeah. So the approach on decision-making um, that I took is, is I took three common decision-making models mm -hmm. um, and I had them try them out. They broke into groups and they actually worked through a situation to try them out. Uh, and then we went into a, a plenary discussion with all of us um, about how they felt about those models. Now, I knew that I did not want them to choose one of those three models because uh, all three of those models have strengths and weaknesses. And this is an emergent organization that needs to actually be leaning into a future um, of how they're working together that needs to be beyond the current models. The experience of the old existing models, they all had fun, but they also, they had complaints. It didn't quite work. There were, um, there were problems with uh, where it could lead, tyrannical rule or um, lack of, of movement or and, and all these conversations around consensus versus consent and all this talk. I think what was most valuable in the experience was the experience itself. Not, not the experience of the models, but the experience of being um, in decision making together. We didn't map out and say, okay, now you're going to get these three choices and we're going to take a vote. They were in, in an experience. And it was an exploration. And that exploration is still going on, that, that there is no defined decision-making model. But guess what? Decisions are getting made. And what's important for an organization is who has a voice in making those decisions. Uh, and right now, it's still small enough that, you know, people can contribute. You have to have a relational lens to make sure there's nobody's grabbing power or trying to take control. Um, but through times like this, a size such as this, you can still navigate without something defined. So I look forward to coming back with you and saying, this is kind of where the group has landed, because it's also very exciting. It, it's for all of them. Um, there's certain people who want certainty and just tell me how it's going to be and what I should do. But for most of them, they feel like they're in a new frontier. And uh, there's also this sense that whatever we end up doing, we're going to have the dynamic in place that the model will be secondary. And guess what? The model can change and it probably should. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's brilliant, Todd. Wow. Um, what I'm hearing is uh, you're guiding this group into the experience of mapping itself. Now, it's not so much that, you know, we think of decision-making process, A to B to C, done. But what you're helping these people discover through direct experience is that a quote-unquote decision is actually, it's very much the way the brain works and creates stuff. Um, it's a, a converging of data, and everyone is adding data. Everyone is adding experiential information. Everyone is adding insights, and that data converges and takes shape, and that shape is the quote-unquote decision. And so you've guided them into an experience where they're finding out that they are mapping their way. And they don't need the linear process. Everybody can feel the limitations of it. Uh, linear logic process. It, it's just confining. <laughs> right? So this is also yep. a way we want clarity on their purpose. They'll find the clarity in the, this way of mapping who they are, what they do, what they're facing. That, that's actually a, a decision-making process. That's how um, conscious systems work. They take in data, the data gets converged um, in order to produce something useful to the whole system and the system moves on. So it's brilliant. You walk into experience to find more experience. 
Right, right. You walk into experience to find more experience. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious in the, the work uh, that you do, if that lack of, um, of control or certainty, does it create a barrier? Are people willing to, to walk into that experience that le- will lead to experience? Or some hurdles that have to be jumped before then? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's going to be really tough for some people and um, just a blessing for other people. And as I always say, it all depends on how people are using awareness. So um, one of the things that very few humans in the world today realize is that we walk into the unknown every microsecond of our lives. We have no idea what the next second is bringing until we've lived through it and then we have a memory of it. So we're, we're in uncertainty. We're merging into uncertainty all the time, but we don't want to believe that. Right? We really don't want to believe that. And most people, because their awareness is mostly in the linear functioning of their brains, um, they are looking for A to B to C. They want one straight line. and They want a logic underneath it. It's this, then that. If that, then I've got one alternative and I choose A or A prime. This is how most people live. So, so the uncertainty of this experience that you've described could be very frightening for people. And we can't make people relax their awareness into a bigger experience. So in, in my work, um, one of the big things I have to track and to recognize is the people um, who are not ready for a larger consciousness. There's no blame or judgment here. They're just not ready. and I don't have any need to frighten it. And so you and I working as advisors to emerging companies, we have to really be attuned to how people are using awareness. But the people who can loose up, put it out into nature, get a little bit more um, oriented to the world instead of the ego level of consciousness, these people will be hungry for what you present in this group. They will want to learn more because as our awareness goes out into the world, the world talks to us. We get immediate deliveries of information all the time. And that uncertainty just dissolves because there's always something. You know, the, the scarcity of fear just goes away because you're full of speech from the world around you. And if you can dip into that experience of the speech of the world, you find out that you already have an innate capacity to process that information. That, that's what your brain does automatically is processing all the time. And if we only put some awareness to it, we find out how good it is. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think you and I, we're, we're involved in risky business because we're, we're going to frighten some people undoubtedly and, and trigger some people. Um, but we have to be courageous enough and non-judgmental enough to uh, to seek out the people who can unfold like this group did with you. It's really beautiful. Well, one of the ways that I use language to um, encourage people who are, are have that that apprehension um, or the fear is just to point towards evolution itself. Uh, that throughout our world, what is evolving does not have a distinct destination. It doesn't have a distinct form to which it's evolving to. It is in the process of evolving. So if you can take on the lens that we're not choosing a model that exists right now um, because we think we're better than anyone or this, this is how evolution happens. So that's one way of doing it. And then, and then another is let's be pioneers. Let's step into the unknown. Let's create something new together. And you get a fair amount of backlash that says, no, we must have proven models. We must rely on the past. The past is what will predict the future. And that force um, will almost always be there. But I often find that the counteracting force is stronger that, that is drawn to what is in the process of becoming and what is possibility becoming real. And so um, it's, it's tricky <laughs> and it, it's risky business, as you say, but um, it's so, also so enlivening for so many people involved 
um, yeah. to say, what are we going to create together rather than what are we going to choose based upon what's existed in the past? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking about the, the life positive flow of energy that is in everyone, every conscious thing, if we can use that word, has a life positive flow. To it. And given half a chance, a human will flow toward life. We do everything we can to stay alive. We really do. Um, that, that's a really big discussion I'm going to put into a sidebar over here, but, but take that, that statement. Um, and, you know, when you find people who, who can um, relax enough into the moment, you can begin to show them that a framework has come into being through a series of processes. And the way a conscious framework emerges is there's a flow. Let's just talk about humans for a moment. There's a flow of, of my awareness to another person to discuss something, a flow of my awareness to an idea that I play with. And maybe I develop a small team and we're flowing awareness outward to other points and creating. And we make enough interrelated connections that all of a sudden we have created a framework that supports the ongoing creative process we're in. You cannot use somebody else's framework to fully support your creative process. Somebody else's framework came from a different origin point. It will not really fit. It's like square pegs into round holes. So the framework is the outcome. It's the outcome. And it really is asking to be created by the creative team, by the company. It's asking to come into um, being for a cycle of action, a market cycle, a product cycle, something. It's asking to be built by the creative team. Um, and again, it's this Western way of using awareness only in the linear aspect of our consciousness. We only see the outcome. So we only see framework. And, and it's not a, a dimension of consciousness that is based in actual sensory experience. So it's very tough for people to feel what we're talking about. So I have tremendous compassion for people who can only see the framework. They want the framework, give me the framework, but they won't be able to use it fully because number one, it's not their framework. And number two, they're not living in experience. So, you know, if you and I have clients like that, we do our best to give them something that will work for them because we have the vision to, to see a framework that's pretty much resonant with what they need. But this is, you know, consciousness, it's a, you have to participate. We, we can't show up. At, here's the thing. We show up at a company and say, okay, we're going to show you how to participate. We're going to participate and do this together. It's like when I'm training people, I say, when we're in a training group, the training happens in the space we create. It emerges up in the center of the vessel that we make. I can't deliver this to you like a lecturer. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but whenever people who can do that brilliant thing you had these people do with three models of decision making that was brilliant you took them into experience and so they discovered their capacity to experience and so their framework is emerging you know i think about governance just one other thing here because just to remember our topic for today um governance one of those crazy definitions i pulled off the web was something about process and i think this this, maybe we need a different word, but quote unquote governance, I think um, we're talking about it being the awareness of process that brings form into being. Yes, yes. What has come up for, for me is when I practice governance in, in my work and, and, and helping organizations and teams with governance, the biggest risk is not the model or the framework that's created, it's rigidity. Mm -hmm. rigidity can also come into play with process by process. What I think you mean and what I mean is being in a participative flow with what is actually happening. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not rigidly creating a process that then we stick to stubbornly despite everything that's happening around us. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the rigidity, I, you know, I, I've, I talk sometimes about hierarchies and, and just like, you know, hierarchies are not the enemy. There's, we, we have too much 
hierarchy in our our world right now, too much imposed hierarchy, I should say. But the problem is not in the hierarchy itself, it's in the rigidity around it, that mm-hmm. we are going to structure it, we're going to construct it, and then we're going to do everything we can to hold that in place. And often that means that the people who have power or are in power in a worldly sense are are holding up those structures rigidly in order to maintain their own sense of power. The practice of allowing flow, uh, allowing fluidity is is that's also experiential in that, you know, if a team can start to feel like, wow, this is amazing how we work together. How did we how, how did we pull this together? We need to codify this and just notice how quickly we go to rigidity instead of just allowing the um, the dynamics to carry us like a wave. Right. You know, uh, I love all that. Um, and it, it brings to mind um, my complaint with the how. Whenever a Western person says how, their awareness has gone from direct experience, which has just told them the how, over to the linear mind, which is not wired to the world. The how question, and people end up asking, well, how do we do this? How did I do that? And the how question, it's really pretty pointless. Because we, to ask that how question, what's happened is we've removed our awareness from the direct experience we just had, which is the answer, right? How is, the answer to how is be that. And so we, we, we run away from experience and we run into the part of the brain that is not wired to sensory experience. And we stand in there and we say, how did we do that? How can we do this? And that part of the only recognizes structure. And so we we get um, derailed and diverted into trying to build a structure that will recreate the experience we just had. And this will never work. And so what you're talking about, fluidity actually, is a principle of consciousness. Um, It's the capacity to, um, I'll say it this way, to allow the big consciousness to flow through you and inform you moment to moment. And that's how you know stuff. That's how you know what to do. And our fluidity is the degree of our fluidity is the same as the degree of our negotiability. And so um, I agree with you completely that hierarchy isn't bad. It's the rigidity and a rigid hierarchy occurs because we lose our fluidity. We step out of direct experience with life and we end up in that little tiny part of it. There is only form. There isn't any flow in and out of there if we're locked in there. Yeah. yeah. And and so framework, it, it has its, everything has frameworks in nature. Good heavens. Our bodies have frameworks, right? And hierarchies. primary, yep. But it has to be responsive. It has to have as good fluidity. And that's a conscious, that's a conscious system that will govern itself if you will. Because it's responding to itself, to all parts of itself, and it's responding to its environment that supports it. Negotiable and responsive. I'm noticing that we we bring this up in, in multiple episodes. I want to highlight that. As long as we're on this topic of governance and related to rigidity, it's inescapable that when you're talking about decision-making and process, that this question of who's in charge comes up. Mm-hmm. And in some some institutions and in some organizations, you have the ultimate person in charge at the top, and that person is in charge. Um, and in a lot more organizations these days, you have more negotiability with who's in charge. It's based upon project. It's based upon initiative. Um, it's based upon timing. What is troubling to me which I'm going to rant a little bit about later, is this question of who's in charge. We need a new question. Mm -hmm. That that's the wrong question to be asking. And I just wonder uh, if we can play with language to, to try to um, displace Mm -hmm. that inclination, which is everywhere. Yeah, Um, absolutely. I would go immediately to a, a big download. I got, um, when I first started bringing 
these technologies into business. The download is that, well, if you think of a business as a, a node, if you will, in the big sphere of consciousness, a node that exists uh, for the creation, exchange, and distribution of value, right? That think of a business that way. Um, and so, what's what's value? Often in Western systems, Western businesses, um, value is determined by position. The person at the top gets the biggest salary, right? But in in biology, value is determined by function the function that contributes to the overall system. And there are uh, indigenous cultures that have existed on planet Earth where um, the culture was led by a man and a woman together. They were of equal value, equal power, but they had different functions. And I think this is actually how consciousness works, right? And so if we are going to have conscious organizations, it's going to shift our understanding of um, who's in charge. We won't ask the question again. We will have a much broader understanding. I Let's say a more intricate understanding of the whole organization and all of the parts, all the functions within it that create the organization. And we will know the value of each of those functions and there will be people who track uh, regions of that functionality to keep the whole going. And so we get a different kind of organization and a different kind of function within the company. So putting one person in charge is a little bit ridiculous. And have, even having the idea that there's one person at the top, um, it's just not how consciousness works. But we've been stuck in Western culture in that mode for quite some time. And it actually bothers me deeply how those single individuals at the top are made into heroes automatically as well, um, that mm -hmm. they have reached the pinnacle. To me, it's not even fully about balancing power. It's, it's how we see the world. And it's sad to me that we migrate in, you know, what we pay attention to and what we talk about to uh, these select individuals, whether they are in government, whether they are in business and industry, whether they are celebrities, those people at the pinnacle, it's more than that we are a ladder as society and everybody wants to be that person. And so we all just focus our attention on them our way of seeing the world as if that is the way it's actually structured comes into play. Like I, I, I don't believe that the most powerful person uh, on the face of the planet is the president of the United States. As mm -hmm. many do. I, I do not believe that Elon Musk is the most powerful entrepreneur uh, on, in the world right now, or, I, or you could name many, many others. And, we could go through lists of CEOs and we could break down all of that. And it's a way of seeing the world that yeah. is, it's, 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 there's a focus on the individual, but it's not also, it's also, it's ignoring all of that, which is taking place and influencing everything else that is happening that is not getting the attention, but is having a huge impact. Yeah. Well, you know, we've we've been uh, as as Western cultures, Westernized people. We've been um, chipping away at our consciousness for two thousand twenty one years, give or take, and so we're pretty deeply into this habit <laughs> of hierarchical worldview, linear worldview, causality, yada yada. Um, and so, it what happens? I'm using a kind of indigenous lens here, but but what happens is we have lost our capacity um, to instill the individual with a functional identity. Our identity needs to be in terms of the collective so we know our values, so we know we matter, so whatever we contribute is priceless. And we don't have that anymore. And what will mm. happen in human consciousness is we need that. And if we can't achieve it, we will project outward. We'll find a model of it. And support the model because somehow in consciousness, we need a, a view of value. 
we need a view that someone, something, maybe we're a reflection of that, that it matters. And we have so stripped the individual, as a general rule, of the, of the power to matter. We've so stripped them of the value, the value of their function in life, that we end up with a whole society based on these projections. And um, I mean, role models are good. That's why we mentor children and, and mentor professionals. Role models are great. But it's if you can imagine just stretching that to an extreme, and then we have one person idealized at the top, right? And everybody is, is giving over their chance to have an identity and instead sucking off that one person. So it's a very extreme situation and it has created, as you said, a, a view of the world uh, that really isn't functional. Yeah. So, um, right. so our identity and valuing one another, I mean, I always think these big principles, we need to bring them down to the, to the runway level. We have to get them right down to ground and put them to work in everyday details. And, you know, really valuing the people that we know, really, I mean, honestly, valuing them, honestly, learning from other people every day, accepting somebody else's contribution. Just take an organization and really get people to work on paying attention to who's contributing what and how it contributes to the whole. It starts to shift consciousness. And so it starts to create a different kind of responsiveness in an organization. I think what happens is, I'm gonna come back to governance if I can. I think what happens when, when we can get people even a little bit out of that stretched linearity and projection way of living, and we come back to every day, everybody matters, and everybody's noticing, receiving, giving, all that stuff, that we start to be governed by the larger forces of consciousness. Mm. And then we have a different idea of governance, a different experience of governance. The, the team that you had do work through those three models, they started to be guided by a larger force. Their realizations didn't come from their ego. Their realizations came by being in an experience of processing data from the world. I got chills when you said that. To allow ourselves to be governed by a larger force. I mean, to mm -hmm. me, that is the new beginning um, mm -hmm. when we look at the series. For our listeners, you may not look around and see organizations or institutions or uh, families or communities where that is evident. What I would encourage you to do is to think about moments, not when you're thinking about the structures and systems as 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 things, but think about moments and experiences when perhaps it didn't matter what choice was going to be made or who was going to make the choice, how do we decide, but that things seem to be working, working effectively, working towards well-being, a collective sense of purpose and, and, and joy. I totally believe that, Marty. I mean, it. I, I experienced that. And so... <laughs> it's a radical thing to say the um we we're talking about governance and we are coming in with this very uh anthropocentric view of of who are the people who are governing and how are we going to structure the people who are governing and <laughs> what if we what if we removed some of the peopleness from governance then what does it look like then it looks like consciousness at work i like that <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have a couple segments plus uh, a new treat for our listeners today. Uh, two takeaways. Uh, Marty and I are, are both going to offer the listeners something pragmatic, uh, a simple step that they can take in light of our conversation today. Marty, um, is your sense we should do the segments and then the two takeaways or vice versa? I think we should do the segments and the takeaways. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I like that idea. That feels right. So Marty is going to take us to the edge for our From the Edge segment. All right. Thank you, Todd. So from the edge today, we're going to look at leading from being a person of power. 
from the edge. And uh, yes, I'm going to give you some definitions in a minute. <laughs> I seem to be into definitions today. In spite of my little story about the poor fellow who was only looking for a definition and ended up missing his experience. Uh, but all the same, language offers us a bridge between experience and definition. So looking at the roots of words, it's kind of like discovering what the bridge is made of and how it was built. And that gives us clues to our experience, even if we missed it in the beginning. And, and I also realized that when we look back at the Latin and Greek roots of our English words, we're, we're looking at just that. We're looking at roots. We're looking at uh, where those roots tap us into our journey. And those roots show us the ground that we walked. So language is like an encoding of our collective experience through the ages. It leaves tracks, it leaves markers of our evolving knowledge, it leaves markers of our evolving capacity to create. So it's really worth investigating. And today we're going to look at this word power. Now, I've been speaking with a lot of people lately about power and empowerment, about what it means to have power as opposed to the indigenous understanding of being a person of power. And I think these distinctions are critical, having power and being power. Um, they mark the difference between our constrained Western style of awareness, which is focused on language and logic and thought forms and so on, uh, between that and the full potential we could regain if we were willing to shift into an awareness that's informed by direct sensory experience of the world around us. So the Latin root of this word power means to be able. And this makes sense to most of us. It speaks to our focus on being able to do things, right? But if we go deeper into the Greek root and its variations, we find versions of the word power that translate into um, potentiality and capacity. And these deeper meanings uh, imply something um, much bigger than just the ability to act, the ability to be able to do something. I think these deeper meanings, potentiality and capacity, speak more of a state of being, implying the ability to act from an inner resource, from an inner energy or knowledge base that has an expressive ability larger than itself. Potentiality and capacity suggest a fertile force that might drive germination and growth. It's not just about the action of a force pushing on something. So now we're getting closer to the indigenous understanding of a person of power. And in indigenous terms, the potential and capacity for leadership, these things rise from the embodiment of the technologies of consciousness, these principles that we talk about here at Leading from Being. And in particular, um, we're talking about the technologies that drive germination and blossoming of a seed, take that metaphorically, of a seed into states of fulfillment. So this is the way we say it in the technologies. It's that agricultural metaphor of a seed germinating, sending roots down and a shoot upward and blossoming into states of fulfillment. In other words, bearing fruit. So you'll notice this speaks of process. Todd and I were talking about process today, actually of dynamics. That's what we mean by process. And these processes, germination and blossoming and, and bearing fruit, speaks of stewardship, not brute force. So when we feel into this metaphor, uh, we can ask ourselves, what seeds are we tending? What processes of germination and blossoming are you stewarding now in your life? And this agricultural metaphor, when we apply it to leadership, it says that the leader is the one who stewards, who focuses the flow of universal powers in order to actually create the seed in the first place and then plant it in a fertile spot and then tend it so it germinates, you know, give it the water and the nutrients and the light and dark that it needs. And as it germinates, grow it into its blossoming stage all the way to fruition. Yeah. So not only is there fruit for the current cycle of action, the fruit has seeds for more. And this goes on and on and on. There's an internal momentum that keeps us going. So the creation of abundance is assured into the future. And the person of power is the one who stewards that process, safeguarding it, 
tending its evolution and not controlling it or forcing it or rigidifying it. So a person of power is a person of tremendous fluidity and negotiability and responsiveness. A person of power is also someone whose individual identity is so well grounded that he is completely part of life. He may be a well-known person, but he doesn't operate apart from the collectives he serves. He's totally woven in, woven in through vibrant relationships. And it's this weaving that fuels the leader's potential, the person of power's potential and capacity to be the steward of abundant processes. You have to be woven in to the collective that you serve. So being woven into an organization, flowing your awareness along relationship lines so you are actively engaged in the dynamics of the relationship. You're learning from your organization as you serve it. This is what a person of power really is. This is leading from being, being part of the system, a well-connected part of a greater whole, expressing a unique capacity in service to the whole. Now, there was a wonderful Andean elder, Don Eduardo Calderon, who talked about power and wholeness. And he said, a person of power is a person living in wholeness, a person who exercises the capacity to be a conduit for all the beauty, vibrant energies, and fertile dynamics that the universe provides. A person of power lives in constant exchange with the energies of life, constantly exercising his capacity to integrate these energies at high levels of consciousness. Now, if we go back to one of our earlier definitions of power, that Latin root, to be able, I think we're being asked to be able in these ways. And if we go deeper to those Greek roots I mentioned, the roots of our being modern people of power are, in fact, in our inner potentiality. The root of our power as modern people is that potentiality or fertility, as the elders would say. And the root of our being people of power actually is in our capacity to germinate and blossom that potential into states of fulfillment and wholeness. This feels really far away from the halls of power, doesn't it? <laughs> so what I'm talking about is what it really means to lead from being as a person of power. It also means that we focus on power as the energy of life itself. It's not something we own, it's something we be. It means we live in the dynamics of life, no longer solely focused on outcomes or endpoints or the things we produce. It means we live in the dynamics of the current moment in an unconditionally loving state. Now, there's another well-known Andean elder, Don Manuel Quispe, and he said, the power to be a steward of life sources from our capacity to love, and the power to create abundance and well-being sources from our capacity for wholeness. Mm. Now, we know, and I hope we're all learning together, that it's only when we slip back into our scarcity mindset, focusing on what's missing or wrong, using power to fix or control things, that we actually lose our ability to be people of power. We lose our ability to lead from that vibrant state of being whole, in love, and fully alive. Yes. Yes. Oh, Marty, that was exquisite. Thank you, Todd. Um, that was an experience for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely yes. All right. Now, Todd, I know you are um, chomping at the bit to rant about something wonderful. So uh, bring us a great conscious rant. Well, it's not something wonderful. It's something that I need to rant about. Um, but hopefully the rant itself will be wonderful. For my conscious rant today, I'm going to question whether we can manage time. Conscious rant. Actually, I'm going to go further than that. 
I'm going to suggest that to try and manage time is going to make you less effective and perhaps miserable. More than a century of time management has yielded more anxiety than productivity. For a little mental calisthenics, I had picked up Carlo Rovelli's book, The Order of Time. As a physicist, Rovelli is expressing possibilities about the nature of time, but mainly he's writing, time is not what you think it is. And this is true in my experience and probably in yours as well. I lose track of this so-called time in moments of inspiration, release, and focus. When I am deeply connected, whether to a task, a person, or an experience, I am not aware of time. Some people refer to this as a flow state or a chirotic moment. In these states, we are attuned to the experience rather than the clock. How much of the day are you in a flow state? And do you plan when you will be in flow? If you're like me, you know that setting the conditions for a flow state do not always make it happen. And yet we learn, which starts with getting out of our heads, that we can be in that timeless state more and more as we move our awareness off of expectations and ourselves. Now, I do rely on my calendar, and in this sense, I have a strong say as to what enters my day and what qualifies as trespassing. In fact, once I tried putting tasks into my calendar, and that was a catastrophe. But just having a calendar and making an appointment is not what I'm talking about with time management. What if using my time wisely was translated as being bound by convention? I'm spending time in a structured way in the way that I'm supposed to. I'm guessing that the people who desperately strive to manage their time might be out of sync with nature's rhythms. Creativity is not managed. Time management is a product of the machine age and tailorism and business management. It's all about control. The idea that we can control behavior in others is harmful. The idea that we can control our own time and how we use it blocks creativity and vitality and connection. Needs, circumstances, and priorities shift. They always do. We can be flexible and adapt, or we can be rigid and ignore the shifts around us. This is where time management gets truly dangerous, when rigidity enters, when it doesn't allow for surprise, when people put on blinders on the, in the face of disturbances. Those disturbances could be opportunity or possibility or beneficial challenges laid at your feet. Disturbances are the nature of life and work. I guarantee you that your time management strategies will be disturbed. So why hold on to them with such a firm grip? Think about all the consequences. You get worried because you're off schedule. You start to panic because you don't have enough time. You start to criticize yourself because you're not managing your time well. We so need a new lens here. Questioning time management doesn't mean floating on magic carpets through the clouds. It means being open and flexible. It means knowing what's important and making adjustments. How you spend your time perhaps should overall reflect on what matters and what you value, but we cannot plan that all out. Years ago, I went through a period of months in which I was obsessed with the question, who's in charge? This question was being posed to the universe more than it was being directed toward the store manager after a bad customer experience. It was an existential phase, no doubt. At the time, I was assuming that there had to be a hand on every lever, and I wanted to feel confident in knowing who had the biggest hand on the biggest lever. I can still have compassion for this younger version of myself because at some level, we are we all believe that control is part of life, that behind every moving object is someone in the command center turning dials. What if this is not true? We cannot command time. We can't even manage it, really. We can't turn the dials and make things happen. So let's stop this talk of managing our time. Let's end this striving 
to control it. Let's stop the phrase of time well spent. Who says that time is something you spend? Let's start talking about our capacity to be aware of what's moving around us and our capacity to move with it. Perhaps instead of asking the question, who's in charge, we should be asking where the charge is and moving with it. Whoa, Todd, that's brilliant. Oh my God, <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, everyone should listen to that one again. Todd, thank you. That's, it's so true, so conscious. Well, you know what? I get a lot done mostly every day, not every day, but mostly every day. And um, I'm just going to confess that I'm no longer having time management uh, as a as a skill that I talk about. So there's a case to be made for not managing your time. Completely. And going with the energies that are flowing through us and around us. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I love it. Ooh, well said. All right. So Marty, do you have a, a takeaway for the day? Oh, I, I have a challenging takeaway for the day. Hope everybody's ready for this one. It has to do with new beginnings, endings, new beginnings. It has to do with power that we've talked about with this um, time management challenge Todd has brought to us. I, I spent a little bit of time with this elder Doman Malkispe, and he was a very, very wise guy. Um, and he really saw us Westerners, and he saw how we would um, do life by friction. If this, then that. If this, then that. Am I there yet? Right. And he would look at us, and he would say, hey, why don't you just create what you want and put it at the beginning of the next phase of your life? instead of grinding toward it as an endpoint. So little project, pick a little something that you want to do that you want to be and just have that be your starting point. Yep. Just create what you want and put it together. We call it a timing, a cycle of action. Put it at the beginning and see how it grows. So, so that's the takeaway. I took the takeaway today as a challenge too. Here is the offer to our listeners. Pay attention to where there is a fertile force. I loved that phrase that Marty uttered in her edge from the edge piece. So where is there a fertile force? And we don't need to define that fertile force now. I think you'll know it when you experience it. And when you pay attention to where the fertile force is, here's the challenge. Don't try to analyze why is that force fertile? Why are good things happening here? Instead, step into the experience. Experiment, take a quick action, be in that fertile force and see what happens. Excellent suggestion, Todd. That was brilliant. And thank you for adding this little segment to our conversations. I really like this. It was very good. Cool. Me too. Yes. So thank you listeners for sticking around with us for a full hour. Uh, enjoy the um, outro music from Cloud Cult. Uh, we love them. And uh, hope to hear you next episode. Marty, it's been great. Thank you so much for being a person of power in my life. Well, likewise to you, Todd. Thank you so much. And thanks so much to our listeners. We'll see you next time. You're a pretty human being Yeah, you're a pretty human being oh. When it all comes crashing down Tree of molecules, a billion baby galaxies and wide open spaces. And everything you need is here, everything you fear is here, and it's holding you up, it just keeps holding you up.
Thank you for listening to Leading from Being. You can learn more at leadingfrombeing.com, including contact information for Marty and Todd. Our theme song is courtesy of Cloud Cult.